Hello guys, welcome to another episode of the Whiskey Diaries. My name is Martin Lang and we're here again at Death and Taxis. Today we're going to talk about uh, Tomatin. Tomatin is quite an interesting uh, story because obviously not all the history but what happened later on. Now in the early 1400s, 1500s, everybody knows that uh, Scotland used to be massive on illicit uh, distilleries, uh, illegally distilling whiskies, the same as Ireland, the same as everybody else. Illicit being defined by the UK government because they weren't paying any tax on it. Obviously, as soon as the government realized how much money there was on taxing alcohol, they started chasing all the illegal distilleries. Anyway, so in the 1500s, Tomatin used to actually give whiskey away or sell the whiskies to uh, people in carriages or people that were walking past the town of, uh, of Tomatin. And they used to basically just fill the flask and walk away. Uh, in the eventually they, they, they became pretty quite popular so eventually in the 1897 they started producing legal whiskey now unfortunately that didn't last long it was only 10 years nine years in 1906 they went broke uh, they went bankrupt but someone took it over and then basically redid it uh, and they by the 1970s they were the biggest whiskey distiller in the world producing about 12 million liters of whiskey a year that is a lot nowadays Kaolila that is one of the biggest ones out there produces that sort of that sort of whiskey amount uh, in the 1980s they almost went broke uh, during the whiskey crash as everybody knows everybody started to enjoy drinking a lot more vodka and gin and, and silly drinks back then um, so they almost went broke and thankfully the uh, Japanese whiskey uh, sorry Japanese company took over the distillery in 1890 1987. Now this is very unique because there's no many distilleries out there that are owned by a Japanese company and since then they've been trying to produce uh, some great single malts. During the 80s, during the 90s and early 2000s most of the whiskey that Tomatin was producing was to go to their blends or to blends in general and when I say most of it I said 80% of it so it's a fair bit. Now early like around the 2010 and so on they started to focus a lot more in their single malts. Now they produce some really, really quirky, really nice whiskies. Uh, most of them are double aged or uh, double barrel, but they, they work around with different types of casks. Now the 12 year old is to replace the 10 year old. The 10 year old was the standard or the flagship as you would say, till about 2009, 2008, and then they started focusing again in the single malts, and they produce a 12 year old. The 12 year old is similar to what Balvini does in which it gets aged in American oak, which ex bourbon cask and then they can age a second maturation on sherry casks. Uh, I'm not sure what specific type of sherry cask will do with this one be, but I'm assuming Olorosa since they do another version of Olorosa sherry. Uh, the 12 year olds is lovely as well. Uh, then we got the 15 year old. The 15 year old comes, this one is a special edition, but they do one that is just a normal standard 15 year old that is basically American oak only. This one in particular gets aged in Moscatel grapes, uh, Moscatel wine casks. So a Moscatel grape is just your standard uh, grape variety where, that they can use for raisins. And Moscatel uh, has a really bad reputation in America uh, during Prohibition time because it was a very low supply of wine and the demand kept happening even though they weren't allowed to sell uh, booze at that time uh, in the 1920s. Uh, Moscatel was basically mixed with cheap brandy and sugar just to make it, just, just to try and sell as, many, as much as they can. So during the Prohibition time, Moscatel grapes or Moscatel wine uh, develop a really bad reputation in America. But even the rest of the world is actually quite a nice sweet wine that you use for dessert uh, and so on. And it's fortified as well. So this one gets aged in Moscatel wines as a second maturation. 46% uh, ABV and we're going to be trying this in a second. Uh, they only produce 6,000 bottles of this one as well. So it's quite, quite, quite nice little special edition. Uh, and then the last one that they got, that we got here anyway, is the 18 year old, uh, and this one is Oloroso Sherry Casks. Uh, this one is a double maturation as well, sometime in American Oak, and then they just, just re-age it on Oloroso Sherries. Oloroso Sherry has a, a, a very famous way of imparting uh, a lot of uh, dry fruits, a lot of tannins into the whiskey, spicy notes, uh, and it's actually a really good way to round the whiskey flavor. 46% uh, ABV as well, so it's a great, great, um, ABV to, to bottle this sort of whiskies. Now for this one in particular we're going to be trying it and as we always say um, going to try we're going to put about this amount of whiskey there and then just let it sit for a second just for the fuse to come out 
good smell. Yeah, that's great. Just the the, the Moscatel grapes. Uh, they really really come uh, Moscatel casks. It just has that sweet notes uh, on the nose. Delicious. Um, so that's again uh, you can you can taste the sweetness from the whiskey. It's actually quite a sweet whiskey, but not in a not in a over sweet way. It's actually really really nice. This will go really well for dessert. I'll put that one so everybody can see them. And then obviously the our favorite like the drops that you want to do just to open up a little bit more flavors into the whiskey. You don't have to always add water to the whiskey. You can just drink it by itself. I just find it that sometimes it's just good to find more complexities and more more. More flavors in the whiskey per se. Yeah, outstanding. So thank you guys again. This is our tomatine release, and uh, hopefully you enjoy the show. Thank you very much. Slangeva. <laughs>